William McKinley would win the election of 1896 against William Jennings Bryan after backing the gold standard of currency, which was the biggest issue of the campaign. This would see the end of the third party system and a shift to the fourth party system. McKinley would run on a coalition of businessmen and skilled factory workers, while Bryan had a coalition of Democrats, populists, and silver Republicans. They each had their own regions too. McKinley had the North and Pacific Coast, while Bryan had the South and Midwest. This would see an era of Republican domination for a while, but don't worry, Brian, your policies will influence the future presidencies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. Brian's group of outsiders would shape the Democratic Party for years to come, and would be the main force of coalition for the Democrats for the next century. When it comes to the cabinet, the Secretary of State was John Sherman, who was replaced by William Day in 1898, who was replaced by John Hay five months later. The Secretary of the Treasury was Lyman Judson. The Secretary of War was Russell Alger, who was replaced by Elihu Root in 1899. The Secretary of the Navy was John Long. The Attorney General was Joseph McKenna, who was replaced by John Griggs in 1898, who was replaced by Philander Knox in 1901. The Secretary of the Interior was Cornelius Bliss, who was replaced by Ethan Hitchcock in 1898. And finally, the Secretary of Agriculture was James Wilson. It's only going to get worse from here, folks. Strap in for the long ones coming up in the next century when it comes to the cabinet breakdowns. In 1897, McKinley would first sign the Dingley Tariff, the highest protectionist tariff that had been seen so far. This bill increased the tariffs on goods upwards to 57% while going through the Senate due to senators wanting to keep increasing the tariffs on goods that affected their domestic products in their regions. The tariff also gave the president the power to reduce tariffs down to 20% if he found the need to. The tariff would only end up increasing the cost of living by roughly 25%. This increase in the cost of living would be mitigated, however, as a rush of gold in the Klondike region would bring in more revenue to the government and help to end the economic depression that the nation had been facing since 1893. The gold rush also helped as McKinley signed the Gold Standard Act, which formally put the U.S. dollar onto the gold standard at a fixed price of $20.67 an ounce. McKinley was also a big proponent of both tariffs and the gold standard, and he would cross both these off his checkbook very, very fast. McKinley also took a lot more minor actions during his presidency, which included the denouncing of lynching, while also failing to make an effort to curb anti-black violence in the South. He also gave 30 African Americans mostly cosmetic roles in the government, like record keepers and diplomats, while also preventing the recruitment of blacks in the Spanish-American War. McKinley would also introduce antitrust lawsuits to corporations that held a monopoly on interstate commerce. He would also endorse the Erdman Act that created a mechanism for mediating wage disputes on interstate railroads. He excluded Chinese workers, used federal troops to put down a strike at Cor de Alain, Idaho, and removed 4,000 people from positions that they had got from the civil service exam. McKinley's main focus, however, in his presidency would be in the international sphere. McKinley would start off by helping Cuban insurgents against the Spanish government. This was because American citizens had become enraged by the oppressive force that was used by the Spanish government on the people of Cuba, and also because American businesses were threatened by the violence on the island. Mostly that last reason. McKinley would push the U.S. to war with Spain in 1898 after the USS Maine was blown up. Future reports found that it was destroyed by an internal explosion, but that wasn't really known at the time. McKinley would give Spain a list of demands, including the independence for Cuba. Spain denied this last demand. Spain would cut ties with the U.S. and send a declaration of war with the U.S. responding with one of their own. In the U.S. declaration, the Teller Amendment was added. This amendment would commit the U.S. to the independence of Cuba at the war's conclusion. The Spanish-American War saw the U.S. defeat Spain in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines within the span of three months. Spain provided to be no match for the Americans. The Treaty of Paris was signed in 1898 and would cede Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines to the U.S. It would also allow Cuba to become independent. Although anti-imperialist movements would oppose the ratification of this treaty, the treaty would end up passing through Congress. During the war, McKinley would also annex the island nation of Hawaii. McKinley would also have to deal with a Filipino revolt led by Emilio Aguinaldo. The war would be bloody and would last until 1902, with the U.S. committing atrocities similar to the concentration camps that Spain had set up in Cuba. Another major issue in foreign policy that McKinley would have to deal with was that of China. Many big nations across the world had been scrambling to carve out a sphere of influence within the struggling giant. McKinley would order John Hayes to deliver the open door policy to China. This policy called for all commercial nations that carved out an area of influence within China to not have restrictions or discriminatory tariffs on each other. It also favored an independent China. This division would come to a head as a group of revolutionaries called the Boxers rose up who looked to expel the foreigners and massacred Christian missionaries. They besieged the location's quarter and was even supported by the Qing Empress Zixi. There was also a split in the royal family with the prince asking for reconciliation. The U.S. would aid in the helping of diplomats who were besieged by the Boxers, along with Britain, Japan, Germany, France, Austria, and Russia. 
the Boxer Force was put down and China was forced to pay the Europeans, Japan, and the U.S. And we are making it to the 1900. McKinley would win the election of 1900 against William Jennings Bryan, again. William McKinley would win this election by even greater margins than the first. He also had a new vice president after Garrett Holbert, his old VP, died. The new vice president was a firebrand named Theodore Roosevelt. The Republican Party looked to keep Roosevelt in a more limited role due to his off-nature politics and progressive ideals. And the vice president only really had the powers that the president wanted him to have anyway. A perfect role for keeping a man in check, yet also making him feel important, or not really if you really know what it's about. The important thing was that Teddy was put back on the back burner, and the Republican Party can do what they needed to do without Teddy pushing them in a direction that they did not want to go right now. And hey, maybe the VP won't be so bad for him, hmm? Maybe he'll be able to, you know, push it somewhere else. You know, in the future. Plus, McKinley was at the top of his game in 1901. He was popular due to the economy coming back strong and his victory against Spain. He would even attend an exposition in September. Big thing for him. Unfortunately, while shaking hands, an anarchist named Leon Salgas would fatally shoot the president. What was that about not wanting Theodore in a position of power? During the assassination, a black man named Big Jim Parker would punch the assassin as onlookers beat him senseless. Even McKinley would tell them to stop while he lay dying on the floor. McKinley would be fine for a while, with doctors being unable to find the bullet. He was so fine that Theodore would go on a 13-day camping trip. Unfortunately, during this trip, McKinley would develop gangrene and die. Someone better go find Teddy. Leon Zalgas, who I will just refer to as Leon, was part of the anarchist group known as the Free Society. They saw any form of government as oppressive, and Leon, who acted alone, would kill McKinley for the good of the people and laborers. He stated that his main influence had been Emma Goldman, and William McKinley would be mourned throughout the world, which also shows America's rising importance in world affairs. When even the Europeans are talking about you and giving you a seat, you know you've made it, at least in this time period. McKinley was a good president. He was able to put in his preferred domestic policy and shape American foreign policy. Uh, above Jefferson, I say. Here are the rankings. Join me next time as that damned cowboy vice president takes office. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week.